So uh, going through Philemon, I'm going to just start with an illustration. You know, um, Nick went into the boardroom knowing that the meeting was going to be difficult. He knew what needed to be done, but he was not quite so sure that the others would, would agree. You know, as chairman of the board, he could force the issue that was at hand, but he knows that if he just does that, it's only going to set up future trouble among the board. He also knows that all of the board has very good reason, whether it be by law or whether it be by practice, to say no to, the, to signing a contract with a company that's let them down in the past. And he understands, too, that many would probably never touch this company again. Some likely even wanted to sue the other company for their negligence in the previous partnerships. But Nick also knew that Due to certain reasons not easily explained that the CEO of the other company had had a major life change in his, in his life, in his personal life, and he wanted to show that he could, again, be trusted. And Nick wanted to give that CEO a chance. And so what Nick did, he opened up the meeting with his board with heaps of praise, throwing out many praise to all of them in the different ways that they had been with him. These, these men and women were bound, they were board members, they had been with him through a lot of things. They built the business with him together. And Nick thanked them all for their loyalty and their support. And Nick knew that the decision before them, that he could count on their loyalty and their support to continue in this manner so that the business itself could thrive all the more through this renewed business partnership. And I tell this story because I imagine that this letter of Philemon is a lot like that. This letter from Paul written to a man called Philemon is a bit similar. See, Paul and Philemon, they were, you know, they were similar to this company in that they'd been through a bit together. The idea here in this book, seven times Paul mentions in 25 verses this idea of a partnership. Or a fellowship. And the, the Greek word that shows up is koinonia. You may have heard that. This fellowship. And it's central to the letter. And Paul's going to call upon it frequently. When you see co-laborer, or you see this fellow, or you see sharing going on in this letter. And Paul calls upon Philemon, his co-laborer in the gospel ministry, and he calls upon one that's in a fellowship as a partner in the business of the gospel together. And he says that they are to walk side by side in this partnership together. Just like he says, the partnership that all believers have with one another. But as we've seen through our, our preaching through First Timothy, it's more, it, it's both a partnership in a business-like way, but it's far more, being in Christ is far more than just simply a partnership, is it not? The church and the people that you covenant with together are not merely partners, but they're what? Family. A family following after King Jesus. A family that is going to live quite differently than the world around them. Why? Because King Jesus and his kingdom looks vastly different than the world around them. And if you go into, into this, this story here, there's some things that are kind of behind it. And you see, actually, this letter, interestingly, is sent, if you go back to the book of Colossians in chapter 4, I don't have it up here, but at the end of chapter 4, Paul is writing that letter to the church in Colossae, which he's never been to, by the way. And in verse 8, he actually says, I send him, talking about this man, Onesimus, I sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know we are doing, we may encourage your hearts. I sent him with Onesimus, the faithful and dear brother who is one of you. I tell you about everything here. Paul sent the letter of Colossians with the man that he's going to be speaking about to Philemon in this letter. He sent two letters back to this man, Philemon, who seems to be a leader in the church in Colossae. If you know anything, it's about a hundred, if Ephesus, where Paul is at the time, he's in what? Anybody know what he's doing in Ephesus at this time when he's writing this? Anybody? He's locked up in prison, right? Paul is in prison for the gospel, and he's writing this letter to a friend, somebody that lives in Colossae about 100 miles away, inland. 
And he's writing from a place where Timothy, as we've been leading, uh, learning, is in, he's going to be leading this church in Ephesus. And he's writing from this place. And it seems that this man Philemon is at, has some point in his life come to Ephesus, 100 miles away, whether it be business or whatever it may be. And he's come, and he's had a chance encounter with Paul while in Ephesus. And through he heard Paul's preaching, he's come himself to be a follower of Christ. And Philemon, it seems he's a man of some means. He probably has a lot of riches. He has some different things. He's a slave owner. But what this man has had, he's had the gospel grip his heart and made him into a man that Paul seems to say a generous and very loving man. And not only him, but also it seems that his wife and his son have also become, what, co-laborers in the gospel ministry together along with Paul back in Colossae. And so Paul's setting up this letter. He sends this off to this one that's a dear brother in Christ, but he's got a problem. Paul has a problem that he's got to address, and this is the reason for writing his letter. One of Philemon's slaves has done what? Has left him, has run away, which in this time, in this culture, was a capital offense, which means that he could easily lose his life, and rightfully so, the slave, if ever caught, could be punished by death. But not only did he run away, but it seems that along the way, what has he done? He's stolen money from Philemon along along with also leaving from his service. And it seems, and I love this, one of those happy accidents, like some of you that have, like Andy who happened, you know, happy accident happened to type in the wrong GPS coordinates one Sunday morning and ended up with Grace praise the Lord, instead of going to the other church. Had you gone to the other church, you might be the associate pastor there. So I'm glad <laughs> that you put in the wrong coordinates. Amen, Amen. right. Amen. But it's kind of like this, this man, Onesimus, he runs away, and little did he know that he would run to a city 100 miles away and likely get arrested. This is, my, this is a speculation. But somehow he runs into, little did he know, that probably... Whenever he ran out of the money or whenever he, whatever, he was thrown into pit prison. And little did he know he was going to be sharing a cell with a man that was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles for Jesus Christ. And Paul says that somewhere along the way that this man ended up hearing from him and everything changed when he met Paul. This man, it's funny, this slave's name Onesimus. Anybody have any clue what his name means? Anybody know? I love names. I was actually talking to a family this morning about how their names have meaning to it. Anybody know what his name means? It's very interesting. Who, who said that? Very good. Did you know that already? Oh, he looked it up. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, I'll be, hey, listen, I, there was a time I looked it up, right? So, I mean, no shame in that. This man's name means useful. And Paul is writing to Philemon, his master, and saying, what? That he has become useless. This man, in his running away, has become useless to Philemon. Right? That's exactly what he was to Philemon, was useless. But in an ironic twist, he becomes quite useful in living up to his name to Paul. And he even becomes, as Paul says, a close partner in the gospel. This man, Onesimus, he says, even shows a devotion to Paul that he never showed to his master, Philemon, becoming for Paul a friend, a brother in Jesus, and a partner in the gospel. But Paul still has a problem, right? Paul cannot shield Onesimus from what's about to happen next. And what Paul is going to have to do is he's going to have to make very high demands, both on Onesimus, Onesimus, but also upon Philemon. Ones that seemed a bit, if you're not, if we're going to be honest, seemed a bit unfair and even a little countercultural, right? Paul knew all the arguments against doing what he's going to ask Philemon to do. But the funny thing is, Paul doesn't argue against any of those arguments, doesn't try to say, well, logically, this would matter. Well, I know that this could be raised, but if you do this instead. No, what does Paul appeal to with his brother Philemon? 
he appeals to the gospel and to love. The gospel, which is far more than how to get people saved. The good news is not merely about how to get people saved for spiritual reasons, just for heaven one day. But the gospel is so much more. The gospel that is about the lordship of Jesus Christ. The gospel of the lordship of Christ over all of the world, over all of our lives, and over all of the many different difficult decisions that we face. I like what Paul says in verse 6. He says, I pray that the faith that you, here's the word, koinonia, that you share with us may deepen your understanding of every blessing that belongs to you in Christ. Paul's saying to Philemon, he says, I want to see the gospel to be productive in the lives of you two men. Not merely that you'd be saved for some future thing, but that the gospel would matter for life now. Not only was Paul a partner with each of them, but now these two men had also become partners with whom? One another. Not only had they become partners, and like it or not, they had become what? Brothers. Why? Because of the gospel. You know, when people come to know Jesus and join his family through baptism, they become part of him. And the sign that we become part of him, I think is like 1 Timothy 5 says what? The goal of our instruction is what? Love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Regardless where our extended family comes from, whether it be male or female, whether they be Jew or they be Greek, whether they be what? Slave or free. In the gospel, all become one. And so Paul is going to make a request to Philemon, one that's quite huge and, and even quite goes strongly against the grain of society. He's going to ask Philemon not only to forgive Onesimus, but to bring him back, not merely as just a slave, but as what? As a brother, as a family member. And I imagine as Onesimus shows up with, Onesimus shows up with this, this letter in hand to hand, to sh- even just show up, the gall to show up to his master once again and hand this letter over. I imagine there's fear. I imagine that there's a lot of unknown. And hoping against hope that, that maybe he reads that letter before he makes any decision on him, Right? Like, please read, can you read that first before we talk? You might enjoy that. Did he sneak a peek before he, I don't know. Maybe he was the one writing it, because Paul seems to, at that one point, he goes, look, I've written this with my hand. This part right here is me, by the way. But Paul sends this appeal to Philemon as a father, he could, he says, I could do this as a father demanding that you do this thing. And he would be right to do so, right? But instead, he appeals to what? To love, to the gospel. And he says, this once useless man, Deborah, this once useless man named useful has now become what? In verse 11, useful. He was formerly useless to you, but he has now become useful to you and to me. Finally, living up to his name. Why? Not because he's done something, but because why? Because Jesus has made him so. Because Jesus takes broken things and he makes them beautiful again. Amen? But Paul even goes on to say later, he says, perhaps, actually in verse 15, he says, perhaps it was for this reason, what? that he might come to know Christ, perhaps for this reason that he was separated from you for a little while so that you would have him back 
eternally. So that you'd have him back no longer as a slave, but as a brother. Perhaps, Philemon, this horrible thing that happened to you, that you lost the one that worked for you, that was your slave, that stole from you, that you lost all of this and are going to get nothing back from it, maybe this happened so that the better could come about, that this man that was useless could become useful as a brother in Christ. So church, you see, this is exactly what the gospel is all about. The gospel is the good news of reconciliation. Reconciliation of God restoring what was lost. First and foremost, the gospel is to reconcile what? I love, I love when, a, 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 like A-team, right, when a plan comes together. What J.J. said this morning, it's just, it's so good. I didn't tell him to say any of that, and it comes together so well. But first and foremost, the gospel is about a God who is reconciling us, we who were far away, back to himself through his son, amen? And in doing so, he does so when we have defrauded God far more than Onesimus could have ever defrauded Philemon. Yet Jesus stood in the gap between heaven and earth when he did what? When he was on the cross. When he spread his arms out, he stood in the gap between heaven and earth and between mankind saying, All things are being brought back together. Paying the penalty for our defrauding and leaving leaving the Father. Counting all of the costs that we had and saying, count it on my account. I will pay it. So that our price might be paid and that we might be reconciled and brought back to God. So that we might be brought into his family as precious sons and daughters. If only we trust that Jesus is the one who brings that reconciliation. That's the gospel. That's the beauty of what Jesus came to do when we were runaway slaves, when we had stolen from God, yet he went and stood in the gap and said, I will pay the price to bring you back. To make you family. And now we have this letter where Paul is calling on Philemon to do the very same thing that he was rescued from. Because in his doing, because why? Because Paul himself is doing it as well, is he not? Look at verses 17 through 19. This is what Paul says. He says, therefore, if you regard me as a partner, there it is again. Accept him as you would me. When you see Onesimus, when he's standing before you, see me. Don't see Onesimus, see me. Now, if he has defrauded you of anything or owes you anything, charge what he owes, what? To my account. I, Paul, have written this letter with my own hand. And I think what he's saying is that I've written this, so there's no question, Onesimus did not write this, okay, and then show up on your doorstep with all these things, so you go, see? No, I wrote this. And I love this cheeky little remark. Like, this is the human part of Paul. I love this last little part. I'm like, you did throw that in there, Paul. You know, I could also mention that you owe me your very self. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that, but I could mention that. I love that. It's just like, okay, just in case. Right? See, Paul's standing in the gap, appealing for the gospel to take hold and to transform this relationship between these two men. Because the reality is, is Philemon had the right, even in Christ, has the right, the legal right, to be angry with Onesimus, has the legal right to punish him, has the legal right to take his life from him. But Paul is going to stand in the gap nonetheless. And Paul is confident that the gospel will show forth and transform the way that these men live. How do I know? Look at verse 20. Yes, brother, let me have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. I love what he says about him. He says, since I was confident that you would obey 
I wrote to you because I knew that you would do even more than I am asking you to do. Paul is confident that the gospel works. He is confident that the gospel will transform the heart of Philemon to be a brother to his once slave, Onesimus, to bring him back because he's also seen the heart of Onesimus go from use less to use full. And how can Paul be so confident? I think like what he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you want to read the whole section, it's a really great section. 11 through 21 is a beautiful picture of the gospel. But I just want to hit two verses in there, verses 18 and 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, he says, And all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, in Christ, in case we didn't get it the first time, in Christ God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting people's trespasses against them. And he has given us the message of reconciliation. This is what the gospel looks like in practice. The good news is more than just simply, I get saved for heaven one day. The gospel transforms the way that we are to live with others in our life. No matter how hard that may be, no matter how much they have defrauded us, no matter how much they don't change, it doesn't matter about the other person. Because it didn't matter about the other person when Jesus laid down his life for us. He said, I do it no matter what because I love you. And he says, this is the ministry that we have to others, is that we lay down our rights, though we may have them every bit, we lay them down for the benefit of others, even if they never change. Jesus did not die just for those who said, yes, he died for the world. And he calls us to the same. And what Paul is asking for is that Onesimus Onesimus be accepted back into Philemon's household, both in his former job, he doesn't actually, notice, he does not tell him he's no longer a slave, does he? It's not there. There's maybe some hints, we'll get to that in a second. But he says, bring him back into his former job and as a brother in Christ. This already is far more than any slave owner could have ever been asked in this or ever dreamed of happening in this society. And Paul says he knows Philemon will do even more than what he says. Perhaps, I think maybe, even giving him his freedom. And were he to do that, he turns the entire world upside down. Why? Because that's what Christ's kingdom does. Turns the world that is upside down, actually turns it right side up. He doesn't turn it upside down. We're the ones that are upside down. He says, this is the way that it's meant to be, and we live in a different way. And kind of like the prodigal son who returns to his father, asking and begging to be just what? A slave in his household? The father says, no, no, no. You are my son. You are much more than a slave. But you know what? Like the prodigal, some are going to grumble. Why should Onesimus deserve any of this? Why should he be rewarded with running away? What has he done to deserve being forgiven and being brought in as a brother? But that is what grace does. That is what the love of God does and has always, JJ, right, always been like. Go read the Gospels and see. This is the love of Christ. But when we do read those Gospels, we should ask ourselves, where in our world 
Where in our church family? Where in our own physical families? And where in our relationships, work relationships, neighbors? Where is the healing and restorative grace of God most badly needed? How can you and I, how can we stand in the middle of the picture, holding out our arms to people who are separated? People on either side of a gulf, some small gulf, some that seem extremely large that we think there is no way to ever cross that gulf. How can we stand in the middle of that, bringing them together that are divided, ready to be, as Jesus says, peacemakers? Ready to be reconcilers in the name of Jesus. Church, I don't, think it, I don't think I have to tell anybody, living in Christ's family is not always easy, amen? Living with grace, giving even though somebody may not give back. Giving whether they are going to take advantage of it or not, that's grace, That's not easy. See the cross. But identifying with the headship of Christ requires much service and sacrifice. But it's in this service and this sacrifice that we show our love, that we show Christ-like love for brothers and sisters, for parents and children, for husbands and wives, for neighbors, for co-workers, for those sitting around us. I think this letter in Philemon is a case study, is a perfect case study of the church living out the gospel and showing that the church is to be the place that is the bulwark of the truth. As Andrew told us about two months ago, it was a long time ago, but we the church, we are the bulwark of the truth. And we must live that out in amongst ourselves into an unbelieving world that is so desperate to understand truth, desperate to see the beauty of the gospel, because nothing else will transform save for the grace of God in our hearts, in our lives, that's going to live out through us in the lives of others. Amen? And that's what we live for. And I think that's what the beauty that Philemon shares with us. Good stuff? Let's pray.